Hey everybody, welcome to The Mana Leak. I'm John as always, and it's time for the Blue Atheros Beyond Death Limited Set Review. As always, a couple quick disclaimers. I am talking about Limited here, specifically Draft. It applies to Sealed as well. I'm not talking about Standard, Pioneer, Commander, Brawl, Tiny Leaders, or anything else. These are also my first thoughts on these cards. These are how I'm going to be approaching the format for the first couple of weeks. My opinions will evolve and change. Make sure you follow along with uh, Pack One Pick One Tuesdays and Spiky Saturdays and over on Twitch to see how my opinions evolve as the format goes. And of course, this is meant to be a jumping off point for discussion. So get down to those comments, chat with me, chat with each other about these cards, how you evaluate them, because we're going to disagree. And that's the beauty of Limited, is that there is so much space for interpretation and evaluation of, on cards, so keep that in mind. But let's get started with Illyrios Enraptured. Illyrios Enraptured is two and a blue for a legendary creature human at uncommon. He's a 2-3. Illyrios Enraptured enters the battlefield tapped. Illyrios doesn't untap during your untap step unless you control a reflection. When Illyrios enters the battlefield, create a 3-2 blue reflection creature token. What a weird card. It's a 5-5 for three, except the 2-3 is turned off as long as the 3-2 survives. But a 3-2 for 3 that says make a 2-3 when it dies sounds pretty decent to me. It's not a bomb or anything, but it's a very nice little creature. So I'd be happy playing it in almost every single blue deck. It's not going to be a bomb that wins you the game, but it's very nice. Uh, solid B-, minus, I think, for Alarios Enraptured. Up next is Ashiok's Erasure. Ashiok's Erasure is two blue blue for an enchantment at rare with flash. When Ashiok's Erasure enters the battlefield, exile target spell. Your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as the exiled card. When Ashiok's Erasure leaves the battlefield, return the exiled card to its owner's hand. In Constructed, sure, we've got kind of like a spell queller on our hands, but in Limited, meh. This is an expensive cancel that gives you some devotion, sure, but as we talked about yesterday, I'm not sure that devotion's really a thing that you're going to go deep on. And it'll trigger Constellation, but Constellation's not really a huge thing in blue. And of course, Limited decks are typically pretty darn close to Singleton, which means you're not even getting the extra value of your opponents not being able to cast their other, you know, Alarios and Raptured or whatever. So D minus for Ashiox Erasure. I think it's pretty darn bad. Up next is Brine Giant. Brine Giant is six and a blue for a creature giant at common. It's a five, six. This spell costs one less to cast for each enchantment you control. So it's got affinity for enchantments. It's a five, six for seven, which is unplayable garbage trash. If you play it for six, well, then it's just garbage trash. Playing it for five, well, we, we've beat the vanilla test at that point, but the vanilla test falls off around four or so. Getting a five, five for five isn't super exciting if it doesn't have haste or trample or flying or something like that. Um, this only really starts to get real good when you're casting it for like four or less, but you're also probably not doing that on turn four or less. You're doing that still on like turn six or seven or whatever. It's a big dumb creature and that's about it. It's at like the C minus range, I think. If you definitely have enchantments, if you're definitely getting at least a two mana discount on this, it's a card that you still shouldn't really play, but you can if you desperately need a 23rd card. So C minus for Brian Giant. Up next is Calife or Caliph or I don't know. Let's go with Calife. Calife, beloved of the sea. Calife is one blue blue for a legendary enchantment creature demigod at uncommon. She's a stars three, so she's the opposite of Daxos because Calife's power is equal to your devotion to blue. Also, creatures and enchantments you control have spells your opponents cast that target this permanent cost one more to cast. It's like half of a frost titan ability. This just seems like a super solid card. It's 2-3 three for 3 that helps protect all of your creatures and enchantments and then grows higher in power as your devotion uh, grows, which is great. You know, Daxos, like I said yesterday, I don't care really if he's a 2-4 or if he's a 2-12. He's not winning me the game with his butt. Whereas if this is a 4-3 a or a 12-3, that's a pretty darn big difference. That's a game-changing difference. 3 power still kind of sucks but she only cost three mana, so you're not trading down in resources here. Um, yeah, she just looks really good, and, and she might be my favorite of the five demigods, I think. She's not quite in the bomb range, though. I think she's just a B. And I don't know, even B might be a little bit too high. Maybe she's like a B minus. She, she's a very good card. Let's go B minus for Calife, Beloved of the Sea. Up next is Chain to Memory. Chain to Memory is a single blue mana for an instant at common. Target creature gets minus four, minus zero oh until end of turn. Scry two. It's like Dazzling Lights or things like that. Single mana to uh, uh, fog or maybe fog-ish a creature and uh, Scry two. 
that's all okay if you're trying to survive. And uh, some of these blue decks do look like they want to be sort of late game control decks. And if this is an aggro format, well, uh, this is going to be needed to try to get there. Whether or not you can get there with this will kind of determine if it's uh, super good or not. I think it's kind of like a, a pretty solid C in a deck that is definitely looking to do that. C plus is probably just a little bit too high. And uh, you know, if you're like a, a blue white flyers deck gonna go get them, this drops more to like a C minus. You can still play it cause it might be that thing that turns the race around, you know, surprisingly and allows you to kill the opponent first. But yeah, C minus C plus for chain to memory. Up next is Deny the Divine. Deny the Divine is two and a blue for an instant at common counter target creature or enchantment spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. Three mana counter spells need to do something for me. This one just exiles a card, which is decent because of escape and stuff like that. But it's still a three mana counter spell in what I think is going to be a pretty speedy vroom vroom format. So I'm just not sure if this is going to have a, a, a real spot. I guess it is just better than a card we'll talk about later today, Whirlwind Denial, which is a conditional counter. Uh, of course, it can counter non-creature, non-enchantment cards. So I don't know. I guess we can keep this around like a... a I'm, I'm going to say D plus if the format is super aggro -y, and if it's not super aggro -y, it can go up to like a C minus or a C. Uh, and in a controlling deck, if they can exist, and I hope they exist, they existed in the original Theros, but I think the original Theros is going to be quite a bit different than what we have here. It's probably still just a strong C there. Up next is Eidolon of Philosophy. Eidolon of Philosophy is a single blue mana for an enchantment creature spirit at common. It's a one two. Pay six and a blue. Sacrifice Eidolon of Philosophy. Draw three cards. Oof, it's a, it's a one, two for one, which is not something that I'm a fan of, but way, 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 way down the line, I can draw three cards. If the format's super duper slow, this could be okay, but if aggro exists, I'd be very wary of this card. It's just not really worth a card until, you know, turn seven, if you hit every single land drop. Um, so realistically, turn eight or turn nine. So yeah, I'm just not super sold on this. Constellation triggering doesn't really matter enough for me. So yeah, I'm, not, I'm out on this card. I don't want to play it. I've got it like a D, a D for Eidolon of Philosophy. Up next is Elite Instructor. Elite Instructor is two and a blue for a creature human wizard a common. She's a two, two. When Elite Instructor enters the battlefield, draw a card, then discard a card. Three mana, two, two that loots. I don't think we've seen this before. A quick scryfall search uh, suggests not, not at three mana anyways. So I'm not quite sure how to uh, how to rate it. Obviously, it's an overcosted bear, which makes me hesitant a little bit. But it does draw a card for you and uh, let you loot. But on like a card that would just draw me a card, if I top deck this, I am just going to draw a card and then discard that card if it's the only card in my hand. So it's a little bit worse than I think it could be, but it's probably still just fine. I don't know if I'm going to creep up into the C plus range, but I think a, a solid C is totally fine for Elite Instructor. It's just going to feel bad in those situations where you do top deck it with an empty hand. Up next is Glimpse of Freedom. Glimpse of Freedom is one and a blue for an instant at uncommon. Draw a card, escape for two and a blue, exile five other cards from your graveyard. So the escape cost on this is insane, and it's the thing that made me realize that, you know what, escape might be something you do once or maybe twice in a game of limited Theros magic. To which I'm sure I hear you saying, oh, but you self-mill in blue-black. Well, we're still talking about double digit percentages of our deck to escape this card once. If you're self-milling yourself enough to escape this multiple times, you're dying to self-mill. So I think this is like a super weak think twice. I think you're just paying two mana to draw a card, which is way worse than opt. And then maybe in the late game, you're going to do it again. So I think this is like a C minus. If you're desperate for a card, sure, this is okay. You can put it in, but I'd prefer not to. So C minus for Glimpse of Freedom. Up next is Ichthyomorphosis. Ichthyomorphosis is two and a blue for an enchantment aura at common enchant creature. Enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a blue fish with base power and toughness 01. I expect this to be about as good as Frogify. Similar to Kazmina's Transmutation, we're in a world where creatures might get bigger than their printed stats thanks to auras, so do be aware of that. But like I said about Banishing Light yesterday, don't get overly clever and start thinking that this is awful. I think people do that way too much with Frogify style effects, with pacifism style effects. 
and I think it costs them pretty heavily. So, you know, I think this is totally fine. Maybe not quite as good as Frogify, but probably still better than Kazmina's Transmutation, which also was fine. Not great, but fine. So I've got this at like a B minus, B minus for Ichthyomorphosis. Up next is Kiora Bests the Sea God. Kiora Bests the Sea God is five blue blue for an enchantment saga, thankfully at Mythic. Act one, create an eight eight blue Kraken creature token with hex proof. Act two, tap all non-land permanents target opponent controls they don't untap during their controller's next untap step. Act three doesn't matter because the game's over. Act three says gain control of target permanent on opponent controls untap it. This is just absolutely insane. It's extremely close to literally just saying the words I win. Uh, to be fair, it does say kill me this turn or I win. You know, you get that 8-8 Kraken, maybe they can still go around it or over it and kill you that turn. But if they don't, they are going to be completely defenseless and you're going to be hitting them for at least eight if you have no other board state. And if you do, it's going to be more than eight. And then next turn, they're probably still going to be basically defenseless. Maybe they played one creature, maybe they lucked out and they played two, and they're still probably just dead before Act 3 ever matters. People have said, oh, but there's enchantment hate in this set. If your opponent is saving their enchantment hate to turn seven, then you can maybe just kill them with your enchantment creatures and your auras and your other stuff. So I do think this card is going to be just a slam dunk A+. It's going to be nigh on unbeatable, and it's going to be just an absolute ruiner of games of limited magic in this set. Thankfully, it's mythic. Thankfully, it's not a cycle of cards at this power level. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I dislike it. Now, one thing is if this format is super fast, which I'm putting a not outside chance on, this card actually could be bad because you're never going to live to seven mana. You know, put this card in Amonkhet and this card is unplayable. So we'll keep an eye on that. Assuming that you can play this card, it's an A+. A+, for Kiora Bests the Sea God. Up next is Metamize Prophecy. Metamize Prophecy is one in a blue for an enchantment saga at Uncommon. Act 1, Scry 2. Act 2, choose a card name. Don't do anything about it, just choose a name. Act 3, when you cast a spell with the chosen name, there we go, for the first time this turn, draw two cards. Act 4, yes, that's right, on Theros we can have four Act Sagas, look at the top card of each player's library. So it's two mana scry two, draw two at some point in the future, probably, sure, Sounds totally fine by me. The fourth act is pretty meh. This ability is never worth anything and shouldn't be valued at all, and people usually do. Um, it, it's a bonus on this card. Like, the card's good otherwise. It doesn't have to be there. But don't rate this card any higher because Act 4 exists. This card just seems like a solid B- minus to me. Drawing two cards, scrying two over the course of a few turns seems totally fine. So B- minus for Metamize Prophecy. Up next is Memory Drain. Memory Drain is two blue blue for an instant at common counter target spell Scry 2. Dissolve was one blue blue Scry 1. Adding a mana for a single Scry does make this card worse. Four mana counter spells need to either do something really good as well, or the format needs to be super slow. I'm not sure that either of those things are true. Scry 2 is nice. I like Scrying 2. I just don't like paying 4 to do so. And I think this format might be decently fast. So I've got Memory Drain at like a D plus. I think it's just kind of a, a mediocre cancel. D plus for Memory Drain. Up next is Nader Kraken. Nader Kraken is one blue blue for a creature Kraken at rare. It's a 2-3. Whenever you draw a card, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on Nader Kraken and create a one one blue tentacle creature token. This card seems great. It'll eat removal quickly, obviously, but if it doesn't, you're just going to go off with it. You're going to get a one one and a counter every turn as long as you pay a mana, because of course you're drawing at least once every turn. If you're drawing more cards in some way and paying more mana, that's just great. And it kind of avoids the blowout because, you know, three, four turns later, they kill this. And sure, they killed a really big creature. You still have three or four 1-1 one, one tokens kicking around. Just seems like a solid card. I think it's maybe in like the A- minus range just because it does take some time to get going. And, you know, if your opponent answers this on turn one or turn two of you having played it, 
well, you know, it, it didn't impact the board quite enough. But if it does impact the board, it's going to be great. And it's definitely a must answer card. So A minus for Nader Kraken. Up next is Nyad of Hidden Coves. Nyad of Hidden Coves is two and a blue for an enchantment creature, Nymphic Common. It's a 2 3. As long as it's not your turn, spells you cast cost one less to cast. So the blue red deck is supposed to be the play spells on your opponent's turn deck and I'm not sold on it. The payoffs don't seem terribly amazing, but this card is obviously designed to help that. It's a two, three for three, which is filler. You know, that's like a C minus. You can play that creature. It's not awful. And making your instants and flash cards cost one less is kind of nifty, but I think you need to be pretty flush with those cards to really go off with this. So it's obviously going to be super deck dependent. It's going to range from a C minus to like a C plus. And I'm going to have to play with that blue red deck because blue red archetypes are typically my absolute favorite in most draft formats. And this one's just kind of looking a little bit lacking to me. I'm hoping that when I play with it, it turns out that it's not, but it is looking a little bit lacking. But Knight of Hidden Coves runs from a C minus to a C plus, depending on if you're in the deck or not. Up next is Nyxborn Seaguard. Nyxborn Seaguard is two blue blue for an enchantment creature. Merfolk Soldier at common. It's a two five with no rules text. It's the, uh, the, the blue enchantment vanilla creature at common. So it's constellation fodder, but constellation doesn't matter too, too much in blue, but maybe you're blue white or maybe you're blue green. It's devotion fodder, but devotion doesn't matter a whole lot. Not in blue anyways, so this creature just looks pretty mediocre. It looks like a dumb blocker, and dumb blockers shouldn't be 4 mana. They should be 1 mana, 2 mana, etc. But I guess this is basically Wishcoin Crab, but that of course was a very different format. We'll see if Wishcoin Crab has a home here in Theros. The aggro decks do look like they're going pretty darn wide, whereas in Guilds of Ravnica, the aggro deck was not go wide exactly with Boros. It was go a little bit tall by mentoring things. So we'll see how this does. This probably ranges from like a D to a C maybe. I think this is honestly probably just better out of the sideboard when you do find yourself up against aggro and hopefully not go wide aggro because they can just go around this. Up next is Omen of the Sea. Omen of the Sea is one and a blue for an enchantment at common. Flash, when Omen of the Sea enters the battlefield, dr scry two, then draw a card. Pay two and a blue, sacrifice it to scry two. This one seems pretty darn good. It's so cheap that I think I'm going to give this a go at the start for sure. It's two mana to scry two, draw one at instant speed, which makes this, I don't know, 1.5 times better than an op. Does it make it two times better than an op? I don't think so. But then a little bit later, when I have some mana and some time, I get to scry too. So I think I'm going to start pretty high on this, actually. I think I'm going to start it at a C plus and a pretty strong C plus at that. I'm going to play this every time and pick this like high late pack, maybe like low mid pack. It just looks good. It looks like what I kind of like to do or what I used to like to do in magic before I became kind of an aggro fanatic. Up next is one with the stars. One with the stars is three and a blue for an enchantment aura at uncommon enchant creature or enchantment. Enchanted permanent is an enchantment and loses all other card types. This is great removal for blue, although like similar removal, the creature will still be able to activate its uh, activated abilities or its triggered abilities, but still totally solid removal. Thanks to the enchantment clause, you can also pre-enchant a god so that it never becomes a creature, which is nifty. And if you're wondering why you would ever enchant an enchantment, you wouldn't. But that text has to be on the card because when the enchanted creature becomes just an enchantment, this would fall off if it didn't say enchant enchantment. So it's just a little rules quirk for why that's there. But yeah, this seems great. This just seems like a very, very strong B to me. Uh, it maybe goes into the B plus range. Four mana is a little bit much. I think I'd probably prefer a banishing light or something. But let's go for a B on one with the stars. Up next is Protean Thaumaturge. Protean Thaumaturge is one and a blue for a creature human wizard at rare. It's a 1-1 one, one with constellation whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control. You may have Protean Thaumaturge become a copy of another target creature, except it has this ability. So the next time an enchantment comes down, you can copy. And the next time an enchantment comes down, you can copy, even if it's no longer a Protean Thaumaturge. This seems fun, though, like clones, this is only as good as your deck slash your opponent's deck is, so I think this will be overrated, as most clones often are. It's good, don't get me wrong, and hopefully getting to re-trigger and upgrade this all the time as time goes on is huge. But yeah, I think this tops out at like a B, especially the fact that it comes down as a 1-1, and it stays a 1-1 
until you can trigger it. And that's actually pretty darn bad. So I, I think B is definitely the ceiling here and it might actually be uh, a B minus more accurately. This isn't a bomb unless you have a bomb or your opponent has a bomb. And if your opponent has a bomb, then uh oh, better hope you find that enchantment pretty soon to trigger this. So yeah, B for Protean Thaumaturge. Up next is Riptide Turtle. Riptide Turtle is one in a blue for a creature turtle at common. It's an 05 flash defender. Well, here's a cheap defender. This is I'm, this is what I'm talking about. None of those, none of those five drop defenders, four drop defenders. This is a blocker. If controlling decks can exist in this format, you're actually gonna want this card. Even then, it's still like a C, like a strong C in a controlling deck, because this is going to let you live through some turns that you might not have lived through otherwise. Don't go crazy with this card. And if you're not intending to reach the late game, this card goes way down in value. Perhaps if you're like a blue white flyers deck, this is still decent. This can hang out on the ground. Your flyers can attack in the air. Um, but yeah, I, I think in most decks that aren't the hyper controlling or perhaps the flyers, this will be like a, a D plus, you actually probably don't want to play it most of the time. But if you do have a plan that involves the late game or a plan that involves turtling up, this will be like a strong C. Up next is Sage of Mysteries. Sage of Mysteries is a single blue mana for a creature human wizard at Uncommon. She's an O2 with Constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard. Remember, don't mill your opponent. That is an awful idea in this format with escape and uh, just graveyard recursion that exists in black and black green. Don't do it. If you are playing this, you need to be milling yourself. And so of course that means you need to have a plan of why you're doing that. You are probably trying to escape. You are trying to recur some stuff. But the fact that this is only triggered on constellation, meaning it's perhaps not reliable, does give me a bit of pause. She does not block well. Sure, she's an O2. I think a lot of people see zero slash number and think, ah, oh, a blocker. And they forget that an O2 blocks exactly one time. So yeah, I'm not super sold on this. Obviously in most decks, this is just like an F. You should never play it. But if you do have a plan to work with it and a ways to reliably trigger it, I bet it can do some cool synergy stuff. So this is like a synergy F. Up next is Sea God Scorn. Sea God Scorn is four blue blue for a sorcery at Uncommon. Return up to three target creatures and or enchantments to their owner's hand. This was Sea God's Revenge in Theros, but it didn't hit enchantments. It only hit opponent stuff and it scried one. This seems like probably a little bit of a downgrade, except for those rare times that you do get some value bouncing something of your own. The scry one was actually pretty darn nice on Sea God's Revenge. Also, it didn't cost blue blue. It cost five and a blue. This card will depend entirely on the speed of the format. A six mana sorcery speed effect could just be too expensive. We've seen something like this. I want to say in a core set, I can't think of it right now, but it was way worse. I'm, I, it came to me, I'm going to say Captivating Gyre. Apparently from M20, not that long ago, huh? But it just didn't have much of an impact because M20, you know, was, was a core set. Aggro was definitely a thing that existed there. Whereas Sea God's Revenge in original Theros was actually a really good card because it was such a slow format. So this will be kind of a split grade. It's like a B minus if the format is slow enough to be friendly to it. And if it's not, if it's an aggro heavy format, this is like a D plus. You just can't wait around to cast this. And you're going to be blocking and trading off before you get to this, which means you're not even going to have the board to attack with. So format dependent D plus B minus for Sea God Scorn. We'll see how it shakes out. Up next is Shimmerwing Chimera. Shimmerwing Chimera is three and a blue for an enchantment creature Chimera at Uncommon. It's a 3-2 flyer. At the beginning of your upkeep, return up to one other target enchantment you control to its owner's hand. Uh, important note, this card has no downside. It looks like it has a downside. That text has been a downside in the past, but it does say other, meaning it doesn't have to bounce itself. It also says up to one, meaning you don't have to return anything if you don't want to. Zero is up to one. So it's a 3-2 flyer for four, which is a totally fine card in limited. We've seen that before, and it's always been totally fine. The upside of bouncing something if you want to is just gravy to re-trigger an ETB effect to get it out from underneath uh, an aura removal or something. It's probably just a straight B minus, assuming that you are getting some sort of value out of the bounce. If you're getting literally no value, it's still a 
totally fine C, uh, uh, bordering on C+, just because 4-mana 3-2 flyer is a solid bit of stats for limited magic. So B- for Shimmerwing Chimera. Up next is Shoal Kraken. Shoal Kraken is four and a blue for a creature Kraken and an uncommon. It's a three five with constellation. We found constellation in blue. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. So this is obviously similar to Sage of the Falls, but it's got one more power, but I do think it probably triggers a little bit less than Sage of the Falls did. You know, I think having this is where you do maybe think about playing the Wishcoin Crab Enchantment creature just to, uh, you know, further block. You're going to have yourself a 2-5 and a 3-5 and you're going to loot off of it. Um, so yeah, do yourself a count. If you're a little bit shy of a large number of enchantments, then this card, you know, runs a little bit bad. It runs around the C- minus range. But if you do have a good number of enchantments, it's up towards the C+, plus, maybe even the B- minus if you are flush with enchantments, auras, enchantment creatures, etc. Up next is Sleep of the Dead. Sleep of the Dead is a single blue mana for a sorcery at common. Tap target creature. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Escape, two and a blue. Exile three other cards from your graveyard. This is not an instant. Ugh. This is so much worse because it's a sorcery speed spell. I'm not sure I ever actually really want to play this. Uh, you'll certainly lose to this sometimes where some sort of blue X aggro deck that's been hitting you plays one of these and maybe escapes it right then and there for I guess four mana total and three cards taps two of your creatures and attacks you in so you know there, there's definitely some places for this but I don't know if on average you're gonna do well having this in your deck because it's sorcery speed the whole it doesn't untap during your opponent's next untap step still just means it's being tapped down for a turn and it just gives your opponent way too much information. If this was instant speed, I'd have this a little bit higher at like a C. And as, as is, I think it's like a D minus. Absolutely, if you have a plan and you know that at some point in the game, casting this twice on the same turn will get you through, it could be a totally fine play. I just don't know if the blue decks are really supporting that game plan. So let's go with like a D minus for Sleep of the Dead. Up next is Starlit Mantle. Starlit Mantle is one in a blue for an enchantment aura at common. It's got flash enchant creature that you control. When Starlit Mantle enters the battlefield, enchanted creature gains hexproof until end of turn. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one. So your opponent tries to cast removal or something on your creature. You go, ha ha, pocket sand, and it's got hexproof and that falls off, but only for that turn. Then it no longer has hexproof and you've got yourself a plus one, plus one sitting behind. Trigger's Constellation, that's cute. Gives you a blue pip for devotion, that's cute. Doesn't terribly matter in blue. Yeah, this card just seems like an okay include. It's kind of in where I would usually put combat tricks um, or, or similar things to this. So something like Ranger's Guile, for example. So it's like a C, C minus. You play it as like a 23rd card when you have a spot and you know you don't really have anything else going on. And also, it's a decent sideboard option if you did see a bunch of targeted spells early uh, in game one. Up next is Stern Dismissal. Stern Dismissal is a single blue mana for an instant at common return target creature or enchantment on opponent controls to its owner's hand. So, uh, yeah. About all those auras that you're putting on creatures and Voltroning up creatures. I can two for one you, three for one you, for a single blue mana at instant speed. This will be my most drafted card. It's not quite unsummoned because I can't bounce my own stuff and that's kind of a pain, but boy, am I gonna blow people out of the water. Love this card, I love bounce. I love when bounce is a single mana and when it's instant speed. This card is like a B minus to me. I think it's gonna be huge in this format. There's no bestow. All the auras are real auras, which means they're just gonna go to the graveyard. So yeah. Build up your creatures, give them plus one, plus one, give them plus one, plus oh. I'm gonna bounce them all. B minus for stern dismissal. Up next is Stinging Lionfish. Stinging Lionfish is one in a blue for an enchantment creature fish at uncommon. It's a two one. Whenever you cast your first spell during your each opponent's turn, you may tap or untap target non-land permanent. It's cute, it's a piker at worst, but I'm not sure how much value you're really getting out of this. Like you're probably just giving something pseudo vigilance and maybe making your opponent wary of combat because you could untap something and block with it by surprise. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is probably like a C plus at absolute best. I'm just not sure about the value here. This is just another of the blue red play a spell on your opponent turn payoffs that doesn't seem 
amazing. It, it seems okay, but it's not amazing. So C plus for stinging lionfish, if you're definitely, you know, going to be taking advantage of it. And if you're not like a C, probably just a C, because even if you're not taking advantage of it, your opponent has to respect that you might. Up next is Sweet Oblivion. Sweet Oblivion is one in a blue for a sorcery at uncommon. Target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. Escape, three in a blue, exile, four other cards. Nope. At uncommon, you're just not going to get enough of these. You're going to be lucky to even get a second to make the mill deck work. Leave the secret keeper dreams behind you. This card is pretty darn bad. If you're seriously going off with escape plans, then you could probably target yourself with this. But there's just better options, you know, creatures that mill. So you're milling and establishing the board, not just milling and doing nothing. This is probably just an F sure it'll be cute if you go off with a card that we're going to talk a little bit about in just a bit but it's not going to happen f for sweet oblivion up next is thassa deep dwelling thassa deep dwelling is three in a blue for a legendary enchantment creature god at mythic she's a six five indestructible as long as your devotion to blue is less than five thassa is not a creature at the beginning of your end step exile up to one other target creature you control then return that card to the battlefield under your control pay three in a blue tap another target creature thassa seems amazing under costed stats as usual for a theros god might be a little bit harder to turn on because blue often plays a couple less creatures than usual but hopefully you'll play some more enchantments or something to make up for that flickering creatures to remove negative enchantments re-trigger etbs or even just give them pseudo vigilance is awesome and a four mana tapper is totally fine and limited yes for free or one mana is better four you'll still pay it we've been paying five in throne of eldraine with spinning wheel thassa is a slam dunk a plus and she vies for my favorite god of the set up next is thassa's intervention thassa's intervention is x blue blue for an instant at rare choose one look at the top x cards of your library put up to two of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order or counter target spell unless its controller pays twice x this card seems totally fine especially if the format can somewhat support those slower decks that can you know hang on a little bit until you are drawing a bunch of cards off this if the format is super aggro this is probably still okay but you do have to have some plans on how to not die while not establishing the board when you cast this the idea here is you're drawing three four five cards at some point late in the game but until then if something really scary comes at you then you can probably use this to hard counter assuming assuming that you're putting in you know at least a couple of mana into x seems like a solid card it'll vary in grade depending on the format speed of course you're going to hear that a little bit this week um, but i'm starting it at like a b i think it's pretty darn good it might be my favorite of the interventions as well up next is Thassa's Oracle. Thassa's Oracle is blue blue for a creature merfolk wizard at rare. It's a 1-3. When Thassa's Oracle enters the battlefield, look at the top X cards of your library, where X is your devotion to blue. Put up to one of them on top of your library and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. If X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game. It's an alternate wing condition. I love alternate wing conditions. They have a, a soft spot in my heart but they don't often work. And I don't think this is any different. I don't think you're jamming a bunch of sweet oblivions to cast this and win, because if you mill this with your sweet oblivion, then what? Um, it's a hard to cast worse omen speaker. I'll probably still play it since two devotion by itself means that we are scrying to like a, a, an omen speaker, but you don't get to top top and that could hurt. And then honestly, it feels like if you have more devotion, it feels even a little bit worse. I imagine that's a weird uh, uh, thought process going on and that statistically it's probably still fine if you're scrying 10 and taking the best card of those 10 because that's still the best card of the 10 and the, the, the other cards were random cards anyways. So statistically speaking, it's probably still fine. Um, so I think this is probably just like a C maybe even a C plus, but man, does it suck not getting to actually scry with this. And of course, you're not going to win with this, but if you do, take a picture. 
Up next is Thirst for Meaning. Thirst for Meaning is two and a blue for an instant at common. Draw three cards, then discard two cards unless you discard an enchantment card. Seems like an easy C plus, could potentially even be a B minus. This should be draw three, discard one at instant speed for three mana most of the time in blue X. Obviously, if you've somewhat whiffed on having enchantments in your deck, this is less good, but still totally playable. And I think some people who might not be familiar with things like Thirst for Knowledge might sleep on this a little bit at the start of the set, but they'll learn pretty quick. Um, so yeah, I think this is an easy C+, and if you're definitely doing draw three, discard one every time, I think it's a B-. minus. Up next is Threnody Singer. Threnody Singer is one in a blue for a creature siren at uncommon. It's a 1-3 with flash and flying. When Threnody Singer enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus X, minus zero, until end of turn where X is your devotion to blue. Seems okay, it's a 1-3 flyer for two, which is okay, it's like a C, I guess. Having flash is really nice, it, you know, we can put that up to a C plus at that point, because hey, it's a surprise blocker. And then the ability of potentially fogging a creature is also pretty nice, but still keeps it at around the C plus range. It's like a fairy duelist, except it will generally be better assuming you have any other blue permanents on the battlefield. And even if you don't, even if this is the only thing that you're gonna have, it's still, you know, basically a fairy duelist. You only get minus one minus O, but you get a one three instead of a one two. So seems like an okay C plus. C plus for Threnody Singer. Up next is Thrix the Sudden Storm. Thrix the Sudden Storm is three blue blue for a legendary creature elemental giant at rare. It's a four five. It has flash, of course, if the name didn't give that away. It's a flyer and spells you cast with converted mana cost five or greater cost one less to cast and can't be countered. Flash flying for five as a four five is super powerful. That's a solid card right there that we're first picking out of a lot of packs. The upside is not a huge upside. You can't just jam your deck full of five, six, seven drops. You will get screwed over by that. You won't draw Thrix. You won't draw enough lands to cast them. They're all gonna be in your starting hand. You're gonna have to mulligan more. You will get screwed. So the upside is there, but it should only help you like once maybe twice in a game ever. Um, but still, it's a solid B minus, even if we ignore that text. Um, but do not mesh your curve up just because you have this card in your deck. Uh, strong B minus, and in fact, you know what? Four, five, flash trample. Let's go for B, straight up B for Thrix the Sudden Storm. Up next is Towering Wave Mystic. Towering Wave Mystic is one in a blue for a creature Merfolk Wizard at common. It's a 2-1. Whenever Towering Wave Mystic deals damage, target player puts that many cards from the top of their library into their graveyard. Eh, this just seems pretty darn meh. It's a piker that will probably help your opponent by giving them escape fodder or their escape spells into the yard if you do target them. If you target yourself, cool, you're helping your escape plans, but you're getting in with a 2-1 what, like once or twice in a game um yeah I, I don't know i think this is a piker that might have some slight upside but do not target your opponent with this not in this set um so yeah i've got this like a c minus um you know the 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 text on this card doesn't really push it above the usual piker grade c minus for towering wave mystic up next is Triton Wave Rider. Triton Wave Rider is three and a blue for a creature Merfolk Wizard at common. It's a 3-3 three, three with Constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, Triton Wave Rider gains flying until end of turn. A 3-3 three, three for four is overcosted, obviously, but Constellation making this fly? I'm pretty sold. This card should play better than it might read at first, just because a 3-3 three, three flyer only needs to hit a few times to end the game. It's a solid C+, I think, and if you're stocked with enchantments, this goes up to a B-. If this flies every turn, it's great. And even if it flies a couple of times, that could end the game. So yeah, C+, B-, for Triton Wave Rider. Up next is Vexing Gull. Vexing Gull is two and a blue for a creature bird at common. It's a 2-2 Flash Flyer. That's pretty good. That's pretty aggressively costed. I did a search for similar creatures through Magic's history, and they're typically uncommon and 2-1, but they do have an ability with them. The last time we saw a three mana 2-2 Flash Flyer was Morning Tide. That was uh, 12 years ago by my count. Or at common, that is. We have seen a couple of uncommon since then. 
This at common honestly seems a little bit pushed. A 2-2 Flash Flyer for 3 is very good and, and should basically be in every blue deck ever. Uh, it could be your finisher. It's obviously going to take several turns, but if they don't have a flying blocker or kill this, it's going to do 2, and then it's going to do 4, and then it's going to do 6, and then it's going to do 8. Um, a couple of these could just end the game real fast. Seems like a pretty premium common to me, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see it possibly in the top 3 blue commons for the set. Still, it's not going to be any higher than a C+, but it's a strong, strong C+. Up next is Wave Break Hippocamp. Wave Break Hippocamp is two and a blue for an enchantment creature horsefish at rare. It's a 2 2. Whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, draw a card. Now, here's a payoff. It's a good payoff. Drawing a card once during my opponent's turn, that's nifty. You know, that turns Glimpse the Future, Glimpse of Freedom into draw two cards if we cast it at instant speed. That makes Thrill of Possibility not have a downside, kind of. We still have to discard the card. But yeah, this looks like a good enough-ish payoff for the blue-red deck. It's rare, unfortunately, which means you're not going to get it a whole bunch. And it's still, you know, it's nothing like Iron Crag Pyromancer. Iron Crag Pyromancer bolting the face or bolting a creature possibly more often because you could draw your second card on your turn. You could draw your second card on their turn. You know, it, I'm, I'm just sad about the way the blue-red deck works, okay? I really hope that it's actually better than I'm thinking. Um, but as is, this card's fine. It's a 3-mana 2-2 two -two with a definite upside, assuming that you are playing instants or flashcards. If you literally have none, sure, it's not great, but you're going to have some. So I think this is like a B- in probably every blue deck. And of course, in the blue-red deck, it's going to pop up even more to like a B- maybe even a B plus, but I think that's a pretty high grade for a card that's just drawing you cards. Those high grades are typically saved for you're gonna win the game real, real soon, or premium, premium removal. Our second last card is Whirlwind Denial. Whirlwind Denial is two and a blue for an instant add-on common. For each spell and ability of your opponent's control, counter it unless its controller pays four generic mana. So it's three mana for a uh, an extra mana leak, a slightly better mana leak, because I have to pay four instead of three. This is a card that I'll play. I I've played this before in various sets. You know, it's Convolute, it's Spell Shrivel, it's typically a hard counter unless the games go really really late this one has the bonus of uh, countering abilities which is not something you typically do not in limited anyways but it can come up and it's probably pretty rare that you're going to have multiple spells on the stack that you get to counter but if you do well you got there all in all this is an okay counter spell that i'm going to play a little bit more often than i probably should I think realistically it's around the C minus range. I'm probably going to play it a little bit more around the C range though. And our final card for today is Witness of Tomorrows. Witness of Tomorrows is four and a blue for an enchantment creature Sphinx at common. It's a three, four flyer, pay three and a blue, scry one. Five mana, three, four flyer, little bit over costed, but okay. You know, we've seen this with prized griffin and a shining arrow soar, I'm going to say was the flying dinosaur from Ixalan typically been in white, not in blue, and they've always been okay. They're not amazing, they're okay. This one's an enchantment creature, which of course means that you'll trigger constellation. I also feel like I do need to remind people a little bit that this is an enchantment. So you know all that enchantment hate that people are talking about and are super excited to main deck and are saying, well, banishing light's not that good because of enchantment removal. Enchantment creatures have the same flaw. So while they're a bonus for Constellation, they are a flaw because there's even more removal than normal for the enchantment creatures. But anyways, this is, you know, a fine card as long as you can support casting five drops, which, you know, is going to be deck dependent. There are going to be decks where a five drops just kind of going to be something that's not going to make the cut. Now, if there is control possibilities, and I'm going to say it one more time today, I really hope there are. This card could be pretty darn good because it's going to hold back and block a little bit and it's going to just be a thing for me to sink mana into. And if I have eight mana, I'm going to scry two. You better believe I am. So my hope is that this card is like a B minus in said late game controlling deck that is totally okay with five drops. My current expectation is that this card is closer to like a C a card that you can maybe play and you can try if you want to try for that deck, but it might not be the best plan. So that's going to wrap it up for all of the blue cards today. There's some definite good stuff in blue. I'm so excited that there is an unsummon in this set for a single man at instant speed. 
like I said, I'm going to blow so many people out of the water who are trying to be way too cute with auras and going all in on one creature. Um, Thassa might be my favorite god in the set. Um, they're all pretty darn good, but Thassa I just really like. So yeah, let me know what you think of the blue cards in this set. Let me know what you agree with, disagree with. Chat with me. Chat with each other in the comments down below. As always, if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me over on Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. Twitch specifically next Wednesday. I will be playing Thero Sealed a day early on Arena. Thanks to Wizards of the Coast for inviting me to that. You can always go over to patreon.com slash the mana if you want to help out financially, get access to the discord and work your way towards earning a playmat, etc. And if you do have playmat or dice bag needs, you can go to inkedgaming.com slash the mana to let them know that I sent you there. They are great and really fast shipping as well. The easiest way, of course, to help out is to like, share and subscribe. But if you do have any questions, comments or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you tomorrow for the black set review.